Hello everyone and thank you for joining our Your Overseas Home webinar today. My name is Roseanne Bradley, I'm a senior copywriter at Your Overseas Home. Today we'll be chatting with John Dyking from Chase View Cannon about financial considerations you should have about when moving to Spain. Um, it's great to have so many of you with us today, whether you're joining us live or watching on demand. Um, once John has finished his presentation, we'll open the floor up to questions. Um, if you have any as we go along, please do pop your question in the bar at the right on the right um, and I'll ask them on your behalf. Um, so John, it'd be great if you could start by giving us a quick introduction to who you are and what Chase Buchanan do before we get into your presentation. Yeah, good afternoon everyone. So uh, I uh, work as a private wealth manager for Chase Buchanan. I'm based in Marbella. Uh, I'm a Swedish national. I've lived in Spain for over 21 years. And for most of this time, I've helped expatriates with the financial planning. So basically, uh, I have a, a number of clients that I uh, look after the, the family finances, making sure that uh, their arrangements are structured in the right way uh, in Spain for tax efficiency, for capital growth, uh, to re receive a, an attractive retirement income, etc. So I help uh, people with their investments and pensions down here in Spain. And uh, Quite often we uh, help people in the transition period before they move to Spain so they can look at things before they become Spanish tax residents because sometimes it can be uh, a bit too late once you uh, already become a resident here. Pap, and can you tell us about um, the tax year in Spain? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, Spanish uh, tax rules and a tax year is very different from the UK. Uh, so. Uh, you know, in the UK, the tax year goes from uh, 6th of April to the 5th of April, whilst in Spain, it's the same as a calendar year, going from the 1st of Jan to the 31st of December. Um, so uh, I think what's um, important to, uh, to highlight regarding the Spanish system is that um, there are different regions in Spain that, have, that are autonomous. So the tax laws are different in these regions. Uh, so I live in the south of Spain and Andalusia is the largest region. Uh, the rules here are, for example, different from the ones in Madrid and Alicante. Um, so many people ask themselves, uh, you know, when do I become a tax resident in Spain? Um, so the generic rule is that you become a tax resident in Spain if you spend at least 183 days in Spain in any calendar year. Um, that's the main rule uh, that applies in most cases. But when there are any uh, cases where it's not clear cut, um, then you look at where is the center of your economic interest. And if your spouse is resident in Spain, then the Spanish authorities will by default uh, assess you as being a Spanish resident as well. Uh, thanks. Um... And what are your fiscal obligations if you're a Spanish tax resident? Right, so once you become a Spanish tax resident, uh, you'd be liable uh, to pay Spanish tax on income from all your sources worldwide. So it means that whether you have uh, buy-to-let properties in the UK or other countries or investments uh, in other countries, uh, but you, you receive an income as a Spanish resident, then all those incomes will be, uh, you know, assessed for Spanish tax. So um, you you'll be liable for income tax on your worldwide earnings, capital gains tax if you have investments uh, and, and have gains on selling investments or selling buy to let properties, for example. Uh, um, you may be liable for wealth tax depending on the region where you live in Spain, because it's been abolished in some of the regions recently. Um, and you be liable to complete uh, a report about your assets abroad, uh, which is called Monella 720. And also, um, if you pass away in Spain, and uh, if um, if there's a if one of the beneficiaries of your wealth lives in Spain, or if someone inherits Spanish cited assets from you then those assets will be assessed against Spanish inheritance tax as well. 
And income tax, is this payable on worldwide income or just in Spain? Yeah, so uh, you'd be liable for income tax on any sources of income uh, worldwide. Um, and the income tax in Spain uh, depends on which region you're a tax resident in, but it's pretty similar uh, in most regions. Uh, so um, we'll look at the scale on the next slide. But uh, yeah, what's important to highlight here, I think, is that um, you are liable uh, to make this declaration uh, by the 30th of June in the following tax year. So for example, for any income that I earn in 2023, um, I need to make sure that my accountant sends in my tax return for my income between April and end of June next year. Um, and, sorry. I'll let you go. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, this is a slide uh, that shows uh, the tax rates in Andalusia, which is the region I live in, the largest region. And, uh, you know, it may be a bit different in other regions, but it's not going to differ a lot. So you can see that the tax rates start at 19% and they go up to 47%, but only on, on really large incomes. It goes that high, but it's, it's, it gets pretty steep. Um, when it goes above 60,000 euros, that's when the rate is 45%. Uh, so as an example, if someone has a retirement income uh, or pensions adding up to about 35,000 euros, after personal allowances, the tax rate, the effective tax rate will be in the region of 20%. And then in for capital gains, is that the same kind of rates? No, as you can see on, on this uh, slide, the rates for capital gains are much more attractive than for income from work and pensions. So um, capital gains tax uh, or savings tax, as it's called in Spain, it applies to interest from bank accounts, uh, dividends from shares, in, or dividends from, uh, you know, um, it can be from a, a unit funds, uh, or if you sell a, a property, uh, especially if it's a second home uh, by to let, then you will have liable for this uh, tax. Uh, so uh, if it's up to 6,000 euros, then the rate is 19%. And then you can see that it goes up depending on the amount of, uh, of, of gain that you have in the year. And this is, uh, these rates are personal. So if you have, uh, for example, investments held jointly uh, uh, as a couple, then it's up to 12,000 euros so you can have in gain and be taxed at 19%. And is that um, this income rate tax, is this the same for wealth tax? Um, no, so wealth tax is um, a separate tax to the previous taxes we discussed. So wealth tax is quite unique to, uh, to Spain. Uh, uh, there are not many countries in the world that uh, have wealth tax. Uh, so it's a tax on your wealth and it's taxed on your net assets after deducting uh, liabilities. Um, so this wealth tax, it's, uh, it doesn't apply in all regions. It used to apply in most regions except Madrid, but last year it was abolished, uh, practically abolished by Andalusia and then uh, Mercia followed suit, which is also here in the South and uh, but you still pay wealth tax in regions like Alicante, for example, which is a big region for expats. They are still liable for, to pay wealth tax. And, uh, you know, this is uh, something that applies on assets over 700,000 euros because you have a personal allowance up to that figure. And also, if you own a property in Spain, which is your main home, then you get an allowance of 300,000 per person. So, um, so these are the general rates. Uh, there may be some exceptions. For example, in Alicante, the general personal allowance is, is only 500,000. Um, but the general rates means that a couple that have about 1.4 million in assets and uh, 600,000 euro uh, Spanish property, they may not be liable to this wealth tax at all. Right. And... Uh, what we see here is a national solidarity tax. So this is a new tax that uh, was brought in um, towards the end of last year. 
um, and it's it's a it's it's another wealth tax, but it applies on higher thresholds. So it applies on assets uh, net wealth over three million, and the exemptions, the, the personal allowances are the same as the normal wealth tax. So it's normally seven and a thousand general and three and a thousand on the property, and this is all per person. So uh, it means that uh, a couple with eight million euros in assets may not be liable for this tax at all. Um, and this tax applies in some of the regions that uh, abolished wealth tax last year. So this still applies in Andalusia, for example, and Madrid and Murcia. And also, sorry, I forgot to mention one thing, uh, if you don't mind going back a slide, uh, Rosan, that um, uh, any, any liability for wealth tax at the lower thresholds you get credit for when you calculate this tax. So you're not going to pay two types of wealth taxes. This is just one that starts applying at a higher level. Right, and um, another um, thing worth mentioning is Modelo 720, which is I mentioned uh, at the beginning. It's a report uh, about your assets abroad. So when you have um, cash held in bank accounts or investments, or properties abroad, um, as soon as any of those three asset classes are worth more than 50,000 euros, then you need to um, declare uh, those assets in the report. So for example, if I have a UK bank accounts with three different banks and I have, uh, let's say um, 20,000 pounds in each bank, that's 60,000 pounds in total, I will need to declare those accounts in this report because it's more than 50,000 euros in total. Um, and this is uh, reported on an individual basis for the full value of the assets. So, for example, if I have a, a UK property worth, uh, let's say, 200,000 jointly with my wife, then each one of us needs to declare the 200,000 uh, on this report. But it's worth mentioning that uh, this is only a report for information purposes. It's not an extra tax. And would that apply to, um, say, if I'm a Spanish resident and... I um, have capital gains from an investment. Right. So, uh, if you have an investment that's worth over fifty thousand euros abroad, then this goes on this report. But the actual capital gains are not uh, reported here because they're reported on, you know, as 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 capital gains in your income tax return. And is that the same for inheritance tax and gift tax? Yeah. So. Uh, Inheritance tax is uh, something that will be assessed here in Spain. If, uh, if, you, uh, if you pass away and any of your assets go to another Spanish resident, or if uh, you pass on your Spanish assets um, to anyone in the world. So for example, if I uh, own a Spanish property and I have children in the UK, um, then when I die and if, I, if, if assets go to my children, then any Spanish assets will be assessed on, on Spanish inheritance tax. But if I have a, a bank account in France and they live in the UK, my children, then there will be no assessment for Spanish uh, inheritance tax. So I think um, it's important to point out that uh, this tax works very different from the UK because uh, in the UK, you have something called an estate and the state has a nil rate band of 325,000 pounds per person, which is the tax exemption. And then normally um, anything above any nil rate band is available. You can also have a residential nil rate band for property. But once you deducted the nil rate bands, you tax at 40% on the state. Whilst uh, in Spain, uh, this tax is worked out on the individual that receives the inheritance. So, uh, uh, for example, here in Andalusia, um, there are rules which say that uh, if you pass on assets to your spouse or to a child or a grandchild, then each one of those beneficiaries have a 1 million euro allowance. So it's only if you receive more than 1 million that it's going to be assessed on tax and there are further you know, tax uh, benefits for inheritances above 1 million. But the general uh, rule is that uh, in, in most regions, there would be uh, some kind of tax payable 
uh, even between spouses and down to children, but most regions have uh, some kind of tax allowances or credits. So um, the, the way the Spanish system works is that the closer the relationship, like the, you know, down the bloodline or to your spouse, you normally have more benefits. Uh, and the more distant relatives you pass on your wealth to, or if you pass it on to a friend, uh, which can apply, for example, for people that have no children or uh, people that uh, have stepchildren and want access to the stepchildren, they got to be really careful because uh, those beneficiaries can um, attract a lot of, uh, you know, well, they can attract inheritance tax at high rates. So it's important to plan things ahead if, if that's mm. your situation. Yeah, definitely. Um, where you said um, it's a sliding scale, does that mean um, depending on the amount, it will have a different rate of tax? Yeah, that's right. Uh, um, it, you know, the higher amount you inherit, the higher tax you pay. So, but it also depends on the relationship that you have with the person that receives the assets. So, uh, as I mentioned earlier, if it's a close relationship, the tax will be less. If it's uh, a distant relationship, the, the tax will be more because the the rates you see here they're multiplied by a factor depending on the relationship. So, if you don't mind um, uh, moving slides. Um, you can see that beneficiaries in group one and two, which are spouses, children, and grandchildren, they multiply the rates by one, whilst uh, groups three and four, which are more distant, so it can be uh, you know nieces, nephews, uh, siblings, for example, they multiply by 1.5 or 1 1.9. Um, so the rates can, can go up quite high in some Spanish regions that can go above 80% if you if you pass on all your assets to your friend. So that's why it's, again, very important to plan things ahead. There are ways to switch assets around and, and set up structures to reduce uh, this tax on death. Would, um, say, you're um, in a couple, but you're unmarried, would that, um, does that get a bit complicated? Are you yeah. automatically in group? Yeah. Yeah, and if uh, if I get clients that uh, don't they're not married, I say get married straight away because because <laughs> that really helps. You know, uh, if you're married, uh, then you get lots of benefits and allowances, uh, both on income tax side of things and as well as you know be, be getting protection when you inherit because uh, you normally get much better allowances. If you just if you're a couple living together, not registered anywhere, just uh, just uh, you know living together, then um, that such a couple will be treated as 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 uh, as very distant. You know that they don't benefit from any tax credit at all on inheritance. So, in Spain, you can either marry uh, if you want to get this protection, or you can register as a civil partnership in Spain. But it's got to be the Spanish type of civil partnership, which is called pareja de hecho in Spanish. Uh, so, if uh, a client has already registered a civil partnership in the UK, for example, I would normally recommend that they make sure that they also qualify as pareja de hecho to, uh, to avoid any problems in the future. That's good to know. And in terms of wills? Oh. Yeah, so uh, um, I think it's important to understand uh, when you set up a will in Spain, so perhaps once you come down here once you bought a property you want to make sure that uh, the property is covered on the Spanish will uh, or any other assets you have in Spain um, you know I, I normally recommend that you set up wills in every country where you have assets um, but it's important to understand that the Spanish system which is uh, you know Spain operates civil law while the UK has common law so uh, uh, you know there's something called forced hairship in Spain which means that um, uh, when you pass away, uh, the majority of your assets uh, have to go to your children by force. And, you know, many of my clients, they, that's, that's not what they want to happen. They want everything to go to the surviving spouse on first death. And then they want the children to benefit of second death. So that isn't compatible with Spanish rules. So what people can do in this situation is that when they go to a Spanish notary, set up their will, they can say that uh, for distribution of assets, they want the, the law of their nationality to apply. For example, for British nationals, uh, there's total freedom of distribution. So the British national can decide who they want their assets to be passed to and in what percentages. 
Um, so as long as you tell the notary, they will uh, include a clause in your will, and this will be respected. Okay, this is part of uh, like a European law, um, which is called um, Brussels 4, came in a few years ago, and you know it says that you know people's nationality should be respected for this purpose, and this is something that applies in spite of Brexit for UK nationals. And it's important to point out that this is only a law that you know allows you to freely dispose of assets on death. It's got nothing to do with inheritance tax. So uh, you you know Spanish rules will still be applied on Spanish assets. You can't you can't uh, do anything about that. Okay. Um, I always ask this question: Do you have any pitfalls to avoid for buyers in Spain? Yeah. Do you do you mind switching slides? Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, um, quite a few things to consider when you move down to Spain, especially from the UK, because the tax and legal systems are so different. Uh, so I've got a few points here, some of the main ones. Uh, so be aware that UK tax-free savings products, such as ISAs, national savings and income, premium bonds, etc., they're not tax-free here. They are fully taxable in Spain. Uh, so uh, if you have, for example, uh, an investment ISA, stocks and shares ISA, where you get dividends from your investments, or if you buy and sell investments inside the ISA, then there's no tax wrapper for that in Spain. So that's, you know, any uh, gains you have on the investments when you buy and sell, or any dividends you receive are taxed in Spain on an ongoing basis on your savings tax rates. So just be mindful of that. Um, and also, uh, um, Spain can impose very hefty tax rates on offshore bonds. So be mindful of that as well. If you have any bonds that you've set up which are offshore, then you should review them before you uh, move down to Spain. Um, and also, if you, um, if you sell a UK property, you may be liable for tax in Spain on a property sale. Um, this gets a bit complex because th this scenario will... You know, the, it will depend on your exact circumstances, whether you pay a tax or not. But as a general rule, I do recommend that if you are moving down to Spain, you should sell your UK main residence in the tax year prior to the year that you become a tax resident in Spain. So, for example, um, if I have a UK property, I'm a UK resident now. Uh, I put it on the market right now. And let's say I sell the property in July uh, and I come down to Spain by the end of July and I haven't spent much time in Spain. I can stay in Spain for the rest of the year. And as long as I don't spend more than 183 days in Spain this year, I'm not going to be considered a Spanish tax resident. So uh, the, my first day of tax residence in Spain will be from the 1st of January 2024. And Spanish authorities will only assess uh, capital gains tax on any transactions from the 1st of January 2024. So the UK property sold, that was sold in, uh, in July 2023 will not be assessed for Spanish tax. Um, and there are scenarios when people didn't manage to sell the UK property and they, they sell it in Spain as Spanish residents. And there may be some exemptions and allowances, especially for people over 65. So it's something that we could discuss on a case-by-case -case basis. But as a general rule of thumb, it's much better to sell before you move to Spain, before you become a Spanish tax resident. Um, other pitfalls to avoid? Um, oh, sorry, do you mind just... Yeah, thanks. Um, sorry. If you have a... No problem, no, sorry. If you have a, a pension uh, in the UK... Uh, most people are aware that you know, at the, if you're about to retire, you can take um, a pension commencement lump sum at some point. Um, and if you haven't taken it yet, it's usually a very good idea to draw it down fully because it's tax-free. So you can take 25% of your pension tax-free in the UK because when you become a Spanish tax resident and if you draw a lump sum from your pension at that point, you will be taxed on that as, as, uh, as an income from pensions, which we looked at the marginal rates can go from 19 to 47% uh, generally. So, you know, if you take a lump sum, you go up to higher rates, it can be a very high tax that you could totally avoid by drawing the pension, pension commencement lump sum whilst you're still a UK resident. And another final point I'd like to point out, uh, 
in the UK, sorry, <laughs> please go back here to mind. Thanks, Roseanne. Um, so Spain uh, doesn't recognize trust. So uh, trust is something that uh, is, um, is an Anglo-Saxon uh, uh, you know, structure that is not very understood in Spain because Spain operates, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, civil law. So uh, I do have clients that come down with existing trust structures in place or they've been advised by other advisors to set up trusts. Uh, they just don't work down here in Spain because um, Spanish authorities, because they don't recognize them, if you are the settler of the trust, like if you are the person who set up the trust, you're the one who gifted the assets in, into the trust, then Spanish authorities say that those are still your assets. So if I give, you know, if I settle 100,000 euros into a trust, Spanish tax authorities say, no, that's still your money, John. And I then need to declare that money as my asset abroad and any income generated from the asset, I need to also report to authorities and investment income. So that's why uh, it's normally not a good idea to have trust here. It just costs a lot of money to keep up the structures and doesn't really give any tax benefit in Spain. And finally, do you want to run through your checklist before we get to some questions? Yeah, absolutely, Rosan. Um, so uh, I think you know, one of the first things you should do if you are considering moving down to Spain is to speak to a financial advisor, someone that is fully qualified, understands both the UK and Spanish systems well, and the local regulations, especially the local region that you're moving to. Um, that is really, really important. And one of the reasons you should do it is because, you, you know, we discussed today the UK tax system is very different from the Spanish tax system. So it's important to review your assets to see if you need to make any changes that you can potentially benefit from UK tax allowances and exemptions as a UK resident. And then when you come down to Spain, an advisor can help you out to make sure that any arrangements you set up are efficient in Spain. Um, if you have a a long standing relationship with the UK advisor, uh, you know, some clients are reluctant to give that up and they, they want to continue with that advice because they've been dealing with them for years. But just bear in mind that most UK advisors are no longer able to offer advice outside the UK because of Brexit. So if you tell your UK advisor that you moved down to Spain, most likely they will tell you that unfortunately they can't help you anymore. That's just another reason why you should speak to an advisor that can help you in Spain and understands the local regulations, which most UK advisors wouldn't know anyway because they advise in the UK. They don't understand the Spanish side of things. Um, I think you should also uh, um, be mindful if you sell, you know, if you, if you are going to sell your UK main residence, you should also speak with an advisor to make sure that you don't unwittingly sell it at the wrong time um, so that you're not going to be paying Spanish gains tax on the sale. Uh, so there are like a number of scenarios when you can be liable for tax in Spain, even if you sold in the UK and then moved down afterwards, but you, you moved down at the wrong time. So it's very important that you speak to an advisor so you don't get the surprise tax bill when you uh, come down here. Um, and also understand you know, that because the legal systems here uh, it's very different from, from the UK system. You know, you get a buried in mind for your financial planning generally, you know, estate planning, for example, uh, it will be impacted. You know, make sure that if you come down here with your partner, but you've got children that will continue living in the UK, how can you make sure that on second death, they can benefit from your wealth, from your assets in a simple way? Um, and, you know, because... Um, the Spanish probate process can be quite long. It can take several months uh, for your children to benefit from your assets if they go through Spanish probate. There are, however, some structures which can be used for Spanish tax efficiency where you can also pass on assets without need for Spanish probate. So it's something that could be discussed with a qualified advisor who understands the Spanish rules. Uh, someone uh, like myself, of course. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, so uh, you know anyone that wants to, um, you know, I've um, I've covered off very generic rules today, but you know every person is, is you know different. Everyone's got different financial circumstances, different types of investments, pensions. So I'm happy to offer a free complimentary review 
which can take about one hour, where I can talk about your particular uh, requirements and I can then see how, uh, you know, what steps you need to take as an individual before you move down to Spain. As I said, this is totally complimentary, something that we offer um, clients of your overseas home. Uh, so feel free to, uh, to reach out to me on the contact details you can find on the screen. If you like to uh, schedule a, a Microsoft Teams video call so that we can have a chat and uh, there's absolutely no obligation to proceed with anything, but I may recommend some changes to your current arrangements uh, for you to reflect on. Um, so you've got absolutely nothing to lose if you want to have a chat with myself. And I'm sure we can take away a lot of things, uh, you know, lot, many things that you should consider before you move on. And ideally, you should do this um, about uh, three months at least before you move on. So it gives you time to uh, to make any arrangements and take any relevant actions before you become a Spanish tax resident. Thanks so much, John. That was really insightful. Some Thank great you, tips Rosanne. there as well. Thank you so much. Um, if, if you're okay, I'm um, just running over slightly. Um, we've got quite a few questions. Um, are you happy for me to fire them at you? Yeah, absolutely. Go ahead. Um, um, Michael asks, I have UK investments. If I keep them and move to Spain, can I transfer money from UK investments to Spanish bank without tax? Right. So uh, if, if, you, uh, if, you tr if you cash some of the investments and you know, transfer the money to a Spanish bank, then uh, you may be liable for Spanish gains tax on when you cash, because you may cash at the profit, which then will be assessed at savings tax rates, which we, we said goes from 19 to 20%. And then um, if you then reinvest the money with a Spanish bank, you know, you may generate some interest to return on those investments, so that will be taxable in Spain. So uh, it's important to point out again, as we said earlier, that, you know, uh, as a Spanish resident, you'd be liable for tax on your worldwide income. So whether you keep investments in the UK, whether you reinvest in Spain, as long as you get an income from your capital, you will be assessed for that income in Spain. Thank you. Um, our next question asks, is there a double tax agreement between the UK and Spain? If so, can you pay tax on your UK pension in the UK rather than when you get to Spain? Yeah, so there is a, a double taxation agreement in place between Spain and the UK, which is designed to ensure that you don't pay the same tax twice. Um, so the way it works is that if you are taxed in the UK at source, uh, uh, for example, on a UK pension, then when your accountant in Spain completes your Spanish tax return, you need to tell them that you've been taxed at source in the UK and you will then get credit for the UK tax that, that, have been, that has been paid on your Spanish tax return. And you would only pay tax in Spain if there's a difference. So if the Spanish tax is higher, you would then just pay uh, some difference there. And if the Spanish tax is lower, you can't claim any tax at source uh, from the UK back. Thanks. Um, Jane asks, does the Mod Modelo 720 report include the value of NHS pensions? Um, NHS, pen, NH, sorry, NHS pensions, uh, that's, uh, that's an employee pension, which is not uh, flexi access. So this report, um, you only need to report assets which are fully accessible to you, uh, whilst uh, such type of pensions uh, wouldn't need to be reported on Model 720. No. <clears throat> Simon asks, um, He's, he's married um, and he's looking to buy a property for around 500,000 euros to get a golden visa. He's asking, is it more tax efficient to buy in a single name or a joint name? Um, I guess it depends on what plan Simon has for the property. I mean, if he buys it for a visa, it, you know, it's going to be the main home, at least for the first few years. Um, so... You know, it's, it's difficult to answer that question. You know, um, when uh, it depends on his age as well, because if if uh, if Simon at some point decides to sell his Spanish main home, and if he's over sixty-five when he sells it, and if he's had it for at least three years, then that sale will be tax-free. So any profit he made since he bought it will not be taxed in Spain. Uh, so that needs to be taken into account when you decide. You know, if you buy joint names or or sole name, uh, and also for the Spanish 
golden visa, I think there's an impact. I'm not a visa expert uh, myself, but uh, I, I don't do visa applications on a day-to-day -day basis at all. But, uh, you know, um, I think whether you buy a sole name or jointly will in impact on the visa application process. Okay. Fab. I think we've got time for one more question. Um, yeah. With regards to pensions, would the advice be to take them out early, i.e. if we were moving before retirement age, should we refer rather than leaving them to maturation? Um, so I assume the question is about whether they should start drawing on the pension. Yeah, whether uh, they should withdraw yeah. it early. Right, so whether they should start taking an income, not withdraw the whole amount because if you if you have a, a flex access pension like a sip in the uk and if you draw down a lump sum in spain that's not very efficient because you be you go up to the higher rates um and if you should try to take some income in the uk before you come to spain it depends on the amount you draw because in the uk uh, on pensions you would um have a personal allowance of around twelve thousand pounds roughly and uh you are, can be taxed at, as a basic rate payer, 20%, higher rate, 40%, for example. Uh, whilst in Spain, uh, the rates go from 19 to 47. So I can't really answer that question generically without knowing what type of income uh, that you're looking to achieve. Uh, but uh, the one thing I can tell you for sure about pensions uh, is that you should take the 25% lump sum if you still have it available because that's going to be tax-free in the uk and it will be taxed heavily in spain so that's uh something you should do uh, uh without a doubt fabulous thank you john um some grateful tips and insightful advice there um that is about all we have time for, for today um if you found this webinar useful and um, we'd really appreciate it if you left us a review on trustpilot you just type in your overseas home and we strongly recommend that you get in touch with John and the team at Chase Buchanan um, directly, as he said, to, to discuss your individual requirements. Um, we'll be in touch, um, I believe, in the next few days with um, the link to this webinar on demand and their details for you. So thanks again and happy property hunting in Spain. Bye bye. Thanks, Rosanna. Thanks to everyone. Bye. I appreciate your time. Right, thank you. Thank you. Cheers.